All right, everybody, welcome to the New Orleans Poetry Festival. Um, we're going to turn it right over to Ian Lockerbie, who's going to moderate this workshop. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Really happy to be here. Um, and uh, and yeah, and chatting about eco-poetics, ecology, and some various things with uh, my friends and colleagues, Olivia and Ava. Um, Olivia and Ava and I have been uh, working together in various ways uh, since we met at LSU like, well, like four years ago now. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say we all love each other's poems. Um, or I can say at least that I love uh, Olivia and Ava's poems and, and other work. And, uh, and yeah, we, we, I think we have like really uh, different ways in a lot of ways. Um, but I think one interesting intersection that happens is just like um, some influence with eco-poetics um, and engagement with it, some thinking around it. Um, we got a chance to study eco-criticism with, uh, with Chris Barrett, who's a, a really brilliant scholar at LSU. And uh, um, yeah, and so uh, I've just been thinking about it together since then. Um, so yeah, so the model that we're gonna uh, use here is just sort of passing it around. I think we're each gonna give um, a little bit of introduction or like um, structuring to how we're uh, thinking about ecopoetics and then each gonna like read from our work a little bit. Um, and then at the end, sort of maybe ask each other a few questions um like that and so yeah i think uh olivia will introduce uh ava yes hi everybody all right so i'm introducing ava um originally from oxford ohio ava hoffman is a trans woman poet currently living and working in baton rouge louisiana she has released two full books of poetry bracket ellipsis bracket with Astrophil Press and Love Poems, Smallness Studies with Inside the Castle with more books on the way. She will be a PhD student with the University of Buffalo this coming fall. She also edits Sporazine, a magazine of experimental writing written by trans people. Her website is nothanks.com. All right, uh, so uh, I'm going to get started with just talking about my work. Uh, could I have the uh, screen share uh, uh, access at this point, uh, just so that I can show. There you uh, go. Is it ready to go? Should be working. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Um, uh, yeah, give me one sec. Uh, sorry, uh, I just wanted to, okay. All right, um, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, the work I did in um, uh, Bracket Ellipsis Bracket, my first book of poetry, um, and it's engagement with sort of um, medieval, early medieval magic and ecology, right? Um, yeah, it's available for purchase at Astrophil um, uh, if people are interested um, in reading the whole thing. Um, but so um, this project really began as sort of an engagement with historical texts, specifically sort of the old English metrical charms, which were really interesting to me because they were essentially these poems that um, were sort of instrumental in function, right? Uh, they were sort of, you know, the things like to heal like a wound, right? Or to make a field um, not, you know, to, to make a field uh, be better, right? Um, and, um, I, I was really interested in these, right? Because they felt very actually contemporary in a lot of surprising ways for me, right? In terms of, um, you know, my thinking and engagement with sort of uh, eco-criticism, right? And sort of new materialisms, right? And sort of really thinking about um, 
non-human entities uh, as part of a social space and sort of a reciprocal rea uh, interaction, right? It also really reminded me of things like um, uh, C.A. Conrad's work with sort of um, these sort of somatic poems, right? Which are sort of halfway between spells and performance pieces, right? Uh, and so, um, all of this, this sort of historical writing really was engaging me in a lot of ways. And I was really frustrated with a lot of sort of the philologist uh, consideration of these texts, right? They were very sort of framing these spells as sort of uh, primitive, right? As sort of like superstition, right? Instead of maybe something that is potentially engaging with nature in interesting ways, right? Um, so, uh, and through that, I sort of started thinking about the ways my text could sort of, first of all, engage with the past, right? And sort of the material culture of writing, right? Because um, these are like texts that were sort of passed through uh, generations as sort of like weird little codexes, right? Um, that now just sort of exist in a library. Um, and um, also sort of engaging with an interaction of sort of the past and also the natural world. Uh, and um, maybe some things that I think are, are like interesting, right, is something I ended up doing was looking a lot just like at scans of medieval manuscripts, right? So the one on the left, right, is um, from an actual book of charms. The other one on the right isn't, right, but um, it's very interesting in the sense that uh, you can see that it's like sort of destroyed, right? It's sort of um, in a state of not perfect preservation, right? And it means there's a lot of interesting interpretation uh, that sort of goes on, right? And you get these texts that are sort of half destroyed. It, it really sort of reminded me of, um, if not winter, uh, uh, and, and Carson's translations of Sappho, right? They're sort of these fragmentalized works, right? And sort of um, how these books were sort of part of like living cultures, right? So a great example of this is that a really important medieval manuscript, the Exeter manuscript was used as a cutting board <laughs> at one point in time, right? Um, and, how, and so how it sort of tied into life and also like nature and, um, it's sort of a really fascinating like way of thinking about a text, right? Oftentimes I think in the present text is sort of abstracted from the physical, right? And how do you recreate that digitally is a really interesting question, right? Um, and so, yeah, and then also you can see um, there's sort of also like historical anachronism going on, right? Because both of these, right, especially the one on the right, they took these old manuscripts and they pasted them into like a normal codex to better preserve them, right? So you get sort of, you can see these fragments, right, um, that are sort of preserved. Um, and so I think something that helps get at um, some of the things that I found interesting um, is this poem called The Ruin, right? It's an old English poem. Um, and it's fascinating, right? Because it's this ancient, pretty ancient poem at this point, right? Um, that was talking about an even more ancient time, right? It's talking about the baths that were built in Rome in the city of Bath, right? But, and it sort of talks about these ruins and it itself is sort of a ruin at the same time, right? It's sort of materially enacting what it's talking about. So um, I won't, yeah, maybe I'll, 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 I won't read the whole thing because um, next up is sort of my uh, fake translation of it, right? Uh, where I sort of maliciously uh, misinterpret certain things about this poem, right? But I think um, what's just very interesting, right? Is just this ending, right? Always is like incredible to me, right? The stone building stood, a steam threw up heat in wide surge. The, the wall enclosed all in its bright bosom where the baths were hot in the heart. That was convenient. Then they let pour hot streams over gray stone. Un, 
until the ringed sea, circular pool, hot where the baths were. Then is re, that is a noble thing, to the house, castle, right? Uh, the sort of, and then it just trails off. We don't have the ending of the poem. It's sort of uh, fantastic sort of material engagement of itself, right? Um, and so I'll now start actually reading things. Um, yeah, so this is um, the way I sort of mistranslated this text, right? So um, you can see I, I did include sort of the original on the right. Um, and you can see there's this real engagement with the scrap and also sort of the gap, right? That's sort of the bracketed ellipsis, right? Um, so now I will, I will read. How queer are the wealth stones, fate smashed, castle structures burst, those giant workings crumble, the roofs are torn, the towers rent, the ring gate is bereft with rhyme on its mortar, shelter buildings shorn, cut short, destroyed, age undercut. The earth grip holds its master workers, forewarn and forlorn, in dirt's hard grasp till a hundred generations folk have withdrawn. Oft this wall has remained, stained red and gray with lichen, rain after another, standing under storms. Now the deep arch gate droops, endures yet, keeping persists. Grimly ground, shown she, Cunning ancient work. Mud rinds bent. Power swiftly braided. Queerness in rings, bravely bound. The woman walls in wire wondrously together. Bright were the city buildings, many the bathhouses. High the horned riches, riotous the war hollering. Many a mead hall with men's pleasures were full until fate power transitioned from all this. Slaughtered widely with the slain, days of wickedness came. Death plundered all those men of power, their war walls deserted, becoming wilderness. The city's seat spoil, the caretaker's blood spills. Armies turn to dust, and now these ruins are desolate, and this red arch thing sheds its shingles from the vaulted rafters. This ravaged place has fallen, broken into mounds, where once many noblemen, good tempered, gold bright, bedecked with glory, adorned and drunk with armor's shine, gazed upon wealth, upon silver, upon gemstones, upon riches, upon luxury, upon the precious rocks, rocks upon this radiant city with its broad regime. Stone houses stood, a steam wretched heat, a stream wretched heat, a wide font. That wall fenced all in its bright bosom where the baths were, the heart hot. How helpful, let them, let, let them then flood over hoary stones, hot streams, and until the ringed pool hot where the baths were, then is, that is a noble thing, how the, the city, right? Um, you can see I sort of, in that sort of reinterpret and sort of misinterpret various things, right? I sort of make it about the present, right? Describing sort of um, an era of empire and tremendous wealth sort of eventually having to reckon with sort of the natural world, right? Um, uh, and sort of from this, right, I sort of continue to sort of engage, right? Um, especially with sort of within the sort of frame of transness, it was just very interesting to me the way in which sort of Tra of like transformation of sort of operating in these texts. And this one's a very interesting one uh, because of its relationship to, um, uh, you know, th this was sort of taken inspiration from not really a charm, but like a, a medieval description of someone who was quote unquote 
half man, half cow, right? Um, and sort of reinterpreting that and sort of maliciously engaging with sort of the ableism in that and sort of this sort of half man, right? Um, and it's also this sort of um, relationship with sort of the animal and this anxiety about nature, right? So I will now uh, read. Look upon the face, the, uh, oh, <clears throat> sorry. Look upon the face, the monster fed, torso smooth to touch from neck to navel to touch the shape of hands and from the nickel and from the knuckle from wrist to joint to clavicle to ankle to round to pelvis to loin and look upon the face of deformed its saucer eyes pools of wet mud not speech but soft bellowing Look upon blood and customs, they're wretched. It ate as if it, as if it were, as if it were the face of that beast, the colony's voice, the killing work, blamed for a life and death, its pathetic body. Look and ask what word should be. Who could call this thing without or a man? Yet who could, yet who could deny that which stands and laughs should be the of that of it is not written that nature Her aberrations must be and be made. Her judgments will. Yeah, um, and now I will just go ahead and read some other poems. I think that you sort of getting, how am I on time? Am I okay on time? Um, Okay, um, I will skip forward to this one, actually. <clears throat> um, this is sort of engaging with the fact of this sort of history of erasure, right? Sort of looking at the erasure of these texts and also sort of the erasure of historically of queerness. I will be erased. Imagine breathing unironically, believing your entropy won't be wasted, not frenzied while eking from the rocks, eking from the rocks. I will be erased, my words will molder upon some unknown pile of as the ravings of a mad sort. My body, in back rooms, my body, hatefully, I will be a, in a trash heap, rotting subhuman waste that nobody wants, subhuman, assure themselves while slaughtering the and impure, I will be erased. I want us to be wasted, de de degenerate garbage, king of its, away, its way into heat death when the formless form discards all fullness. Hallelujah, hallelujah, I will be erased. Present creation for their wills, speaking this truth. Do you think an ant could overthrow the anthill, define the rule of her queen? Oh, men's treatises upheld the beehive as biopolitical ideal, and now how else would truth my 
be legislated except by biology. And if the Lord says, I am, I will say, I am not. And if nature says, thou art that this, I'd rather be nothing. That this, this, discard. I'll transform into something damned and inhuman, subhuman? And ripping forcefully firmament and textbook shreds, oh, slither, slime mold, slime mold, slime. And you speak this charm in total darkness, an invisible mirror in your hand. You feel a stuttering, a shuddering, and become something monstrous, a form of of fitting of the crossed out. Uh, yeah. uh, clearly, another hand has scribbled out the end of and inscribed. Let me know if I uh, if I'm running if I run out of time. <laughs> um, uh, I found a hole in the archives page and slipped my finger into it whole, feeling the edge of the vellum soft when nothing revealed themselves to me. Nothing had a hole in their head. The hole in the vellum was an open mouth or their holes were a hole's lack and the hole in them was a hole in me. And the lacuna bit me dainty soft and I lacked a digit dainty soft or blood was in nothing's girly mouth, the wound, their manly grin, or I wounded the archive with my probing figure, fucking the page, and I bit myself, or nothing, or the page, and the wounds a mouth in my mouth, and I wistful pet a hole in my vellum, or I was a hole in nothing, a hollowed out wound, a vile tender touch with blood in my hole, biting and, 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 history. Someone said, I desire what I can't, but I never did not want anything save nothing to reach through the gaps in my record book to kiss a ghost's face like a mirror. But I am too tired to be talking to you about how nothing makes me whole. Soon enough, nothing and history will be sameness and me too, and the vellum and the cities, money, symbols, might, all void. Weakness wins. And I am nothing if not weak, am nothing if not nothing. May I speak it? May I speak my holy pages with neither nothing, nothing? May I? May speak it? Speak? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll read these. <clears throat> so these are sort of specifically en engaging with a specific form of charm, which is sort of like, I basically did a riff on um, like thinking about like the Seder square, um, but it's sort of an, instead of sort of a nonlinear poem. And the Seder square was basically, it's very interesting, right? Because it it's, um, it's really hard to describe, but basically it's sort of a very elaborate, um, pun <laughs> um, in Latin, where it, it, it basically, it's like uh, five five letter words that are acronyms of each other. Um, and so they can be arranged in such a way that they can be read in any order, right? And first of all, just that the sort of, and then it was like inscribed on stones and things, right? It's just very interesting, right? Sort of engaging also with this materiality of language, right? And so um, these poems can be read horizontally or vertically. Um, and also we can see sort of directly um, uh, more engagement with sort of charms. Cast iron panopticon, Strip mall, mine, crypt of currency, changes for a 5,000 years invention, clay tablet, computers labor to grain store age, 
writing to administrate the fail state of the art medium, clay signs pointing to no, no. Cast iron mine, crypt 5,000 computers labor to administrate clay signs, panopticon of currency years invention to grain store the fail state pointing to strip mall changes for a clay tablet age, writing of the art medium, no, no. One may also speak this, these words to amplify the effect. I bury this ward, I bury it in the eggshell dirt, bury worry to shelves where words are failing. The regular is, is a table exerting itself, a normal force of tabulactating budgetary concern, its military drills, boring facts. The regular is exerting itself, tabulactating its military drills, is a table, a normal force of budgetary concern, boring facts. Another use of this charm is to stave off poisons. Um, and I, am I good on time for one more? Cool. Um, this will be the last one. I'll read everything here. Um, all right. <clears throat> Have broken, now with the gentleness of a girl more real, these blankets, this book's killing me, I, are you crying, I, this, this is how I, you cradling a burst shell, the snail's guts, these of a skid mark, her body with my untrained voice, I'm shambles, unarmed, viol volition, nor violation of boyhood, shatterings at, on fingertips touch, waste, forgot how to kiss, surely I'll bite you, I tear at your waist. I know, love to watch, monsterized freaks, to throw pennies at, feet worn raw to feed my parasites, sing more brokenly and scamming you into not killing me, the creep, the bodies stacked up corpse singing, the, for your benefit, Broken isn't always, always, but this hatefully, lovingly, a striptease song for your benefit. My prophet is begone for the treatment of the deep in your skull, the history you can't reach, the suffering of searching, enlist the reality you cannot touch, the lives of the dead with the bodies ripped out. Why are you a tranny? No reason. Why are you're a tranny? No reason. Why am I a tranny? No reason. Why are women trannies? No reason. Why are men trannies? No reason. Why are cis, cis women trannies? No reason. Why are cis men? Why are cis men trannies? No reason. Why trannies? No reason. Why are we trannies? No reason. Why are you a tranny? Why are you? No reason. Why is the gender therapist a tranny? No reason. Why is the hormones trannies? No reason. 
wise, no reason, tranny, no, no real reason, no real trannies, no reason, no real, why no trannies, no real sissies, no real traps, no real femboys, no real transsexuals, no real trans people, no real reason, no real, no real cis people, no real men, no real women, no real gods, no real masters, no real songs, no real poetry, no, no manuscript, no original, no me, no me. Here is my one true charm, my only spell. You should... No, I do not want to end it with a funeral parade. Of pansies, I have only paraphrase. The fumes on my tongues, no. Dosing men with, poisoning men with estrogen synthesis, thine will on earth as, as sex change, as pollen sweet, as child's teeth, as polluted as I am, as this, as I stroke your hair as, as the snow melts, as spines of grass poke out, as it melts the, as spring, as the water runs away, as men and as women, I disappear. Thank you all for your time. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting. Uh, I will now stop sharing. Um, all right, uh, up next is Ian Lockerbie, who I will now introduce. Ian Lockerbie is a poet and translator based in New Orleans. His translation of Gardens by Chilean poet Carlos Cocina was published last year by Cardboard House Press. His work has been and will be published in Denver Quarterly, uh, Six, Six Finch, Interim, Anomaly, Washington Square Review, and elsewhere. He formerly worked as editor in chief, uh, uh, editor -in -chief and translations, translations editor at New Delta Review. He currently teaches at LSU. Uh, here's Ian. Thank you so much, Ava, for the introduction, but more so for uh, the reading and the talk about your work, which was, as ever, super badass, uh, just so wild and, and cool um, and super thought provoking. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I have questions for you now, but I have to wait till the end. So we'll come back. I wrote them down. Um, so, yeah. So, in, in thinking about um, what I wanted to talk about for this for this uh, roundtable, I wanted to talk about um, my my translation of uh, of Carlos Cosina, um, which is here, and you can get from Cardboard House Press, a really amazing press, if you have interest. And um, I wanted to talk about his work, and I also, which which on its own is a, a really incredible. Um, eco-poetic work uh, that really opened up a lot for me in terms of um, how I understood eco-poetics and what was possible in eco-poetics. Um, but I also wanted to talk about like ecology as um, a metaphor for translation and like the collision of ecologies as a metaphor for translation. Um, and I wanted to talk about sort of the influence that Carlos Cosina had on me and my own work. Um, which I started to think about like as a network of, of ideas um, that connected in with a lot of other people uh, who I've read and have been introduced to through Carlos Cusina. Um And also I wanted to talk about farming a little bit, uh, which is like something that I spent a lot of time doing um, before I moved down to Louisiana. So I just started like making notes and putting things together. And um, over the, the past few weeks, it has, I've sort of molded it into, um, 
sort of like a collage of 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 thoughts and uh, questions, um, almost like a lyric essay. Although I don't really want to call it that, um, but that also cues it to uh, to read some poems from other people. So what I'm going to do is read that. Um, what has this collage that has come together through uh, thinking about this and making notes over the past few weeks, and it'll also have. Um, I'll be reading um, some poems uh, from the translation of Carlos Cosina, um, as well as some of my own poems and some other people too that found their way in. To start from the point that language is an ecology, or rather that language mirrors ecology, or rather that mirrors language ecology. With small attentions, one notices naturally formed shapes echoing each other in various landscapes, and colors too, more obviously. These echoing shapes show rhymes across distinct ecologies. They illuminate a certain form of ecological translatability. Clara put this in my mind. I've begun to think about this as a model for translation to seek shapes in the ecology of the original poems to then mirror in the shapes of the new ecology of my translation, a rhyming across landscapes. To engage ecological thinking is to explore ways to think outside of English. Different language sets are different ways of knowing. Of Jody Gladding's book, Translations from the Bark Beetle, Cecilia Vicuña writes, Gladding proposes a new kind of translation where there are only two verb tenses, the cyclical and the radiant. Towards the end of this book is the poem, The Origin of the Bark Beetle as a Written Language. They came down out of the hills, stepping over the cracks where the light broke through the wood. Wood said one, and they remembered how to name the matrix, was also to address it. They practiced walking off their anger. They dug holes to mark how far they walked. Then they could come back to the farthest point. They could compare the lengths of their angers and which was greatest. When the first line divided earth from the sky, that was when they began to count. They counted one horizon, but soon they got bored because two was only two lines, whereas one had marked what was from what was not. One, they grew confident in their sharp nibs. Two, they grew tall and beautiful in the way of shadows. Three, would have been glyphs. They never sign with a flourish. Henceforth, nothing would prevent them from achieving their signatures. First, you must learn to write your name. In this book, Gladding attempted to make interpretations of the physical shapes made by the non-human and remake them in the shapes of our language. As the title suggests, one of the methods she employs is translating the shapes made by the gnawing of bark beetles into shapes within shapes of poems. The Mexican poet Teddy Lopez Mills on a panel just a few days ago, speaking about translating John Ashbery into Spanish said, something that happens when translating avant-garde poetry is that you understand it, but at the same time, you don't understand it. So in many senses, you are translating with your eyes shut or with your mind shut because you don't understand because the poem in a certain way is happening outside the poem. I want to think of languages as ecologies, interconnected and unknowably abundant, as a method of ecological engagement, of seeking abundance, closing your eyes and shutting off the mind, a different attention, to seek the connections and to illuminate them, but also to be wary of them, so as not to flatten the differences, the very real differences, to let infect without. For me, translation has been a time-based practice. Translating Carlos Cosina has been a listening practice that has taken much undefinable time. It's not over. I sit with, listen, sit with, listen again, sit with, listen again, revisit, reassess, 
wait. Shapes emerge with time in the distance and come closer. Poet and translator Donna Stone Cipher in her poem, Ruins of Nostalgia 7, gestures at the time-based practice of ecological observation and minds through the ever-present distance between observed and the observer, the measure of which varies depending on the observer's method, intentions, and focus. The Ruins of Nostalgia 7. Four deer stood poised down in a valley as the train passed by, like four artworks in a museum, framed in the rectangular windows of the train, a tableau vivant that hardly changes no matter how many times the train passes, heading north or heading south, for the poised deer are the same poised deer that stood there a century ago. The streams ferrying their cargo of dead twigs that are the same streams as two centuries ago, the trees felled and planted and tended and felled and planted and tended and felled. The foresters still sculptural and storied. The kids in the woods flirting with addiction to crystal. Crystals forming on the windows of the train, carrying the cargo of passengers whose bloodstreams ferried the cargo of antidepressants, antihistamines, anticoagulants, anti-inflammatories. Passengers who keep glancing out at the Museum of Nature, reminding themselves I've been meaning to visit that exhibit, that exhibit where the deer are waiting for us and not waiting, where the trees are waiting for us and not waiting, where the wildflowers still under the earth are waiting and not waiting for spring to force them out into morbidly orderly inflorescence, where the origin is and is not waiting for its impurity and a crystal palace whose roof fell in on the, itself from its own weight years ago still houses the ruins of nostalgia. In this poem, Stone Cipher broadens the scope of the ecology to encompass the ruins threaded through and around it, and to encompass nostalgia for the ruined, the possibilities of perception and memory, and for the views too. In my translation of the second poem of Carlos Cosina's Gardens, what other gardens are possible? those of the half sphere of the forest or of its vaulting. My possibilities are in extension of the view when aroma is more potent than light, perhaps in the same way that the shadow is in the intensity. In the dawn, the humidity expands and the return of luminosity activates in different form the permanence of plants. In the mornings, when everyone goes to their labors, the gardens mount their solitude while the activity of insects and salts goes on mounting. The public extensions resurge. Private spaces extend beyond the public. Nevertheless, those appear infinite on the paths. Roads whose footprint alone is glimpsed and returns many times back upon itself. There are no jungles nor distant esplanades but ground over which moves a haze, the same that envelops the limits that cannot be quantified. Matter takes all its forms in plants and vegetations when public space is irrigated. The order is that of survival and reproduction in cycles that tend to distinct directions. I draw near the sound that resolves in the aroma of the body itself. Sounds proceed from the movement that light and water emit. About Carlos Cosina's gardens, Donna Stone Cipher writes, nature, culture, and the imagination are hopelessly entangled, to use a key word for Carlos Cosina in gardens. In his elegant, devastating sequence gardens, this entanglement is considered enacted, displayed mind, but never disentangled. Cosina knows it is far too late for that. For some reason, I want to posit an animist approach, that every word is animated, a tender button, each jumps up and walks away, comes back, plants itself and grows, corms or bulbs multiplying underground, stems and blooms upward. To grow some flowers and some foods, like taro, water chestnuts, gladiolas, onions, garlic, and lilies, bulbs, corms, 
or bulbo tubers, underground food storage organs consisting of one or more internodes. I have a poem called The Cost of Labor. The cost of labor, we take them down, slide the hour sharp right through it to the green tangle of feet, watch them afternoon wilt against the dirt, against the sun, and against the dream of it. Tidy plotted earth to harvest and harvest again, wilting in the sun against the dream here with my wit. I true the greening difference. I don't understand the difference. After lunching on the shade of the vine maple, the thought of yourself going back to the field, leaving from leftover shade, having had your fill, but realizing you weren't going back. It was the thought of you. You've already said it, and I'm saying it again. We're going down to the beans and the spinach, scuff them up, shuffle our green and wilted feet. The work's not over, it's under us, rising up into and through and through. Rest your head against the dream a while, harvest your feet, fall down into the market, repeat. In the introduction to Michael Cronin's book, Eco-Translation, he writes that one must take seriously the idea that translation and translators do not exist in isolation, but that they are an inextricable and integral part of a larger physical and living world. Food security, climate justice, biodiversity, water depletion, energy security, linguicide, eco-migration, resource conflicts, global monocultures are, are only some of the issues that will be at the heart of environmental debates in the 21st century and will also need to be addressed by scholars and practitioners of translation alike. Marosa Di Giorgio, as translated by Janine Marie Pitas, that crazy lily is going to kill us. When I was a farm worker, which was my full-time occupation for nearly seven years, I was beginning to develop an ecological vision that not only incorporated agriculture and food, but the politics of agriculture and food too. Plus labor, market, my breaking down body, plus et cetera and et cetera. It was all impossible to disentangle. And also the views. Agriculture is partly a time-based pursuit. You research, rework, reassess, and work. The metaphors are too many. You translate the labor for the market, etc. In much of my poetry, I want to bring across the entanglements, to translate the entanglement to the poetic line. Cosinia showed me a model of poetics that incorporated all of this and much more within an ecological vision. In Gardens, he writes in one of the later poems in the series. Arboreal herbs barely discernible in the mist are there under the horizon. There where the game of solitaire fades expectations, the garden bows towards stadiums of the private. The game is filled with rules that dissolve in every new onslaught of water. Blooming is the necessary access key to the next landscape. What do I have for which you procure my friendship? Zones of risk have their own model of the public and incursion on them extends by hills absent of thickets of reference. The entanglement is an illusion applied to the vegetal. I'm gonna end with um, a poem of my own, which I think uh, not consciously, but had a lot of influence um, from, from spending so much time with Carlos Cosina's poetry. It's called, Where in the Morning, Goosefoot. Water and start the house each morning, germs, then radishes. How's it going here when it came from here in the first place? It's been the longest morning having broken myself in so many ways. Each piece of me with its own new measure of time, it adds up. Thinking about where things come from. How could we charred by the pound when the beet roots the spinach or the amaranth fed to pig 
weed and quinoa in the store forgets where. It comes from the farmers who grew it in the southern climes who can't afford their own crop against northern demand so often. Time and cardinality break down in the body, so we start seeds, pinch stems, fall roots, muscle dirty food towards the sink bays, towards the market, asking, what's going here? We ask again and again, meaning, what stems can we muscle sprout from this field furniture into the dirt future nearing us in acres time and seasonally what? Words will the market harvest mash themselves against in the buyer's mouths? So expensive, delicious, fresh, catastrophe, outside the smoke, what they bother with. So I'm going to introduce Olivia, who's our, our last uh, round table member. One moment to bring up her introduction here. Olivia Muenz is a disabled writer from New York. From New York. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Louisiana State University, where she earned the Robert Penn Warren Thesis Award in prose and served as an editor for New Delta Review. She is the author of the chapbook, Where Was I Again?, which is forthcoming from Essay Press. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Gulf Coast, Black Warrior Review, Pleiades, Denver Quarterly, Salt Hill Journal, Anomaly, Southeast Journal, and elsewhere. She's a 22 Tin House Scholar and currently teaches at Louisiana State University. Olivia. Thank you, Ian. Wonderful introduction. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a disabled writer. So I think about uh, eco-poetics through a disability lens. Um, and Ian and Ava, I've been finding it extremely difficult to not say anything while you guys are talking. So I totally invite you both to chime in if you ever have something to respond to, because I find so much intersection in what we're considering, um, especially like Ava very directly mentions ableism, but even just like the archive and translation as a concept of like translating experiences. Um, I, yeah, there's just a lot of overlap, I think. Um, one of the primary things that I consider in terms of eco-poetics and disability is um, the rejection of, of binaries in favor of the spectral. So particularly a rejection very directly of able-bodied versus disabled, but also things that extend to like the natural versus the unnatural, um, which can be applied to like the built environment versus the wild environment um, or more broadly like order versus disorder. Um, and I'm just gonna start by reading something from Tender Points, which is by a uh, disabled writer, Amy Berkowitz that considers order in terms of language and femininity, which I think is really applicable. Poetry fails me because it's not written plainly. Its oblique nature aligns too closely with the slippery and unreliable speech that women have been associated with since ancient Greece. In the gender of sound, Anne Carson writes, woman as a species is frequently said to lack the ordering principle of cyphrosine. Cyphrosine is a masculine virtue, the use of moderation and self-control in speaking. While men speak with order, Carson believes that the women of classical literature are a species given to disorderly and uncontrolled outflow of sound, to shrieking, wailing, sobbing, shrill lament, loud laughter, screams of pain or pleasure, and eruptions of raw emotion in general. And I just kind of wanted to think about language as disorder as an introduction to my own work um, in my chapbook, where was I again? Um, I wrote it after a long period of being bedridden. It was around six weeks. Um, so my disability, I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. So I'm multiply disabled. I'm physically impaired, mobility impaired, um, but I'm also neurodivergent. And I'm an unhealthy disabled in like the Eli Clare lens of 
like disability theory in that I don't have a static disability, it's ever fluctuating. Um, and so I realized as I was writing that I was trying to force my brain into being neurotypical and I was trying to force an order on it that was actually quite unnatural to the way that I actually think. And so I only used the period as a point of punctuation, which serves as a disruptor in thought, but also as a fulcrum to move through thought more um, associatively rather than linearly. Um, and then I think I make a lot of other considerations around ecopoetics, but I'll talk about that after I read. So this is just the first section of this book. Here is my brain. It is writing this for you in Times New Roman to make us both feel better. We feel even. Here is my brain. Here is my brain on drugs. No eggs this time, only the good ones, the doctor ones, perfectly legal. I feel fine, perfectly regal. I don't feel pain. The earth is rotating on its axis and so is this room and so are you. We are fine. Welcome to my book. Here is the world. We are in this together. The body pulls in towards itself and towards all of us. That is all we need. Am I doing this right? Where was I again? Here is the body of water that you were looking for. Take a drink. Kiss the mirror, it will last longer. Don't forget to call the pharmacy again. Here is the state of things. We are in this together and the room is moving with us. How nice, how orderly, how together we are. I love you for being here with me. We think about hopscotch and that's fine enough for now. I offer us a cold beverage. We love cold beverages, especially when it's hot out. How nice. Here is the fire place. It's warming us up. We needed it. We feel safe now. We breathe it in. The smoke that's good. We're sawdust. We love this stuff. We are so happy we're here. Did you see the moon landing? Here we go again. It's hurtling towards us. Look out, that was close. Let's take a bath. Let's promise each other we'll never bathe again. That will make us proud. That will make us eat peaches. It doesn't matter what we think. We forgot to call the pharmacy again. Here is your brain on music. I'll give it to you, Einstein. I'll take you on a boat and make you watch it sink. Do you believe me now? Is anybody alive out there? Can anybody hear me? Here it is. We've been looking for you and here you were all along. That's the nature of it, we figure. Hide and we'll seek. Do you think we can find it by smell? Should we bake cookies? Can we find our way home from? Here is an orange. Let me show you how to slice it. First, you take an orange. Then you stick your thumb in it. Then you hold it up to the moon. This step is important. Don't think about it. Think about orange juice. Think about swallowing. Spin it like it's the earth. Now you can eat it. Here is that memory I wasn't looking for. You brought it back all of a sudden in a little tote bag. I had forgotten all about it and now here it is. What a surprise. Did you bring a gift receipt? Here is the new one. 
Here is my dusty balloon. I unpacked it just for you. It will stay put if you let it. Give it a kiss. Here is my note. I am writing to you to express my gratitude for your prompt response. It is nice to be thought of so quickly. I've been thinking about what you said about Jan. I am with you for the most part. Have you given any thought to peaches? That is the only whole. Here, I said here, a little to the left, a little more, a bit higher, not that high, but a little higher, yes. Here's your hat, what's your hurry? Here, I'm giving you an out. I'm giving you an out. Well, if you don't want to take it, that's not on me. Here I am, surprise. I got you this time. You should have seen your face. You looked like an icicle. You hardly knew you were dangerous. You keep dripping in my eye. I shouldn't keep looking up. Let me know when you spot the moon. Here we go again. Here, I will read it back to you. So do you love it? You can be honest. It won't hurt my feelings. Well, you could have been nicer about it. Here are my keys. Now get lost. Here is my urine sample. I made it just for you. I hope you like it. I wiped the outside with toilet paper. I even signed it. I packed this silver tray just to deliver it to you. I hope you don't mind the garnish. I couldn't decide between turnips and peaches. Here comes trouble. Here you went. I let you die without asking. I could have done it. I could have made it easier for all of us. But here you were, and I couldn't say a thing besides, no, I am not my mother. It was too late for talks about the Great Depression, our Great Depression. I don't know why, but I knew. I will save them for us forever. We will live on forever. So that's the first section of this chat book. And um, in the second section, I consider more uh, the idea of the normate. So that in disability theory is the um, idealized body that's perfectly able-bodied, which is entirely fictional because it doesn't exist. Um, and also crip time. So particularly with chronically ill people, but you know, throughout the spectrum of disability, the manipulation of time that exists outside of linear time um, and so I think that applies, especially with just the ecosystem of the body and having, you know, impairments change the way you perceive time or experience time. Um, but also the relationship to the world and the ways that we've developed um, an order out of the natural world, particularly in terms of time. Um, so we've really regimented and taxonomized the way that we move through time space when I think the origin of time is through something that's much more natural and through existing and more fluctuating um, rhythms. And something that I consider a lot in uh, eco-criticism is Eli Clare um, is a particularly wonderful theorist. And in uh, The Poetics of Matter, I talk a lot about time and restoration in the natural world. Um, I'm just going to read a little section from that. Um, he says, rather than offer a resolution to this whole range of contradictory, overlapping, and confused meanings of health, I want to follow the word restoration. To restore an object or an ecosystem is to return it to an earlier and often better condition. We restore a house that's falling down, a prairie that's been decimated by generations of monoculture farming and fire suppression. In this return, we try to undo the harm, wishing the harm had never happened. Talk to anyone who does restoration work, a carpenter who rebuilds 150-year-old neglected houses, 
a conservation biologist who turns cornfields back to prairie, and she'll say it's a complex undertaking, a fluid responsive process. Restoration requires digging into the past, stretching forward toward the future, working hard in the present, and the end results rarely, if ever, match the original state. And what I find compelling here is, is this conflation of time that happens in the process of restoration and kind of the fallacy that exists within restoration. And so later on, Eli Clare talks about um, the impossibility of restoration, particularly around disabled bodies. So for me, with a genetic illness, there is no able body version of myself that I uh, can ever return to. And so it's not only a resistance to the cure narrative, which moves forward towards like an imagined future that operates around cure that is fundamentally a return to an unexisting past of able-bodiedness, um, but it just allows for a lot more complexity and reduces that binary um, into something that's much more spectral. And I was thinking a lot about that as Ava was talking, and Ian too, um, but especially around this um, idea of decay. And we see that in the natural world and we see that in our relationship to it and in something like the archive. And what really struck me with Ava's work was the way that she was preserving language and um, the way that you just have to like lose a lot of points of connection. So in like those uh, ellipses brackets, we, we lose those connections. And so we're like maintaining a certain like uh, faith to the source text, but we can't ever do that in the same way that we have to do that with translation. So we're never able to actually like faithfully represent the original thing in a new form, which is something that's like subjected to time a lot, which I think is very cool. Um, and then in terms of translation too, I think, there, Eula Biss talks about um, the pain skill and the translation of experience, particularly in terms of pain and how pain is untranslatable. Um, but it, it's just like interesting the, the need to continue trying doing those kinds of things um, out of necessity because of the interconnectedness in the world, which is like a very ecological kind of understanding of our relationships to one another. Um, and then last, I just kind of wanted to read one last thing of mine before I end, because I know we've, we've gone for quite a while. Um, but I was thinking too about um, these binaries between health and illness. Um, natural versus unnatural, and how the cyborg can um, disrupt those by melding them together. So we see that in monstrosity and like this uh, human animal fusion, and we have the same thing in the cyborg with the human and the technological. Um, and something that I'm very interested in is the synthetic with the natural. So the necessity of um, prosthetics, you know, being like even medicine can be prosthesis. Um, and so I'm just going to read a poem that considers just my experience of, of taking medicine and emerging as a cyborg. Uh, so this is called Migraine. My brain is cooling off in some water. It is floating in my head jar. Do you understand the gravity of the situation. The elixir washes over my brain in waves. It is tugging over like a blanket of fuzz. Do you remember the shape of the weather this morning? The whole world stretches over me to cope me in fuzz. Am I making sense? Am I making something worth listening to? Do you see the room in distortion? Do you see the room in clicks? My special perceivers perceiving their way to the kitchen. I rest my head jar on the door frame. The room is inside out. My fuzz is inside out. I feel my way around my head jar. I feel the elixir inside out. 
Where have I gone again? Do you remember where I came from? The room is full of gravity inside my head jar. Oh, pull me out of me outside in. Thank you guys. Oh yeah, thank you, Olivia. <laughs> um, I have yeah some some thoughts and questions that I'd love to throw at you, Olivia. So we have yeah we obviously lost, uh, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess before I um say a thing or two to Olivia, like I would love to just open it up if anyone else uh still present has any thoughts or questions, um, because yeah we've been talking enough, but. Thank you, Flower and Jeff. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Flower was curious about the, the formatting of Olivia's work. Ah, uh, so how it's like visually appears on the page. Yeah, yeah, because um, I'm just struck by how you read it. And I, I just really was curious how it translated on the page to mimic the thought process especially since you said how you use the punctuation to really mimic that. And I was just curious. Yeah, I can actually, I could do a screen share. That'd be great. Um, I would just need the access. You should be able to now. Um, yeah, so this, if they're essentially functioning, this is the book itself. So this is the um, opening to it. Uh, so it's essentially like prose poems, but it's just disrupting where you would normally, I guess, have a period appear and all questions are rendered into declarations. So we only have the period, but um, this is the formatting throughout. So this is the first few pages. Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. I think because of um, seeing Ava's poems too, the visual component, I, I think it like, and just hearing you read it, I was just like really curious. So thank you for sharing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for asking. I love thinking about like the prose poem as this like, uh, this form of endless possibility and like, and also like confusion and disorientation. Um, like I, I brought prose poems to my poetry students fairly recently and we just like talked for the whole class about like, why is this a poem, right? And I think there's so many interesting questions and it also makes me think, I wish, uh, of course I wish Ava was still here to, to talk on this. Like Ava's always being like, I don't want a left line poem. Like I don't want it, I have no interest in it. And Ava's uh, work has like drifted more and more into like visual poetry. Um, in really fascinating, interesting ways. But I feel like one um, sort of more um, traditional way that I think Ava continues to write in is like prose poems, because I feel like it's, yeah, just one that feels like endlessly generative um, in a poetic way. Um, but yeah, I was, I was so interested in um, something you said, Olivia, about the period as a fulcrum to move through thought, I think is, was the quote. Um, I was, I was curious if you could expand on that just a little bit. Well, I think as I was writing it, I was thinking about it as this disruptor. Um, but I think like naturally, even when you're thinking, no matter how like neurodivergent you are, there is some organizing principle there. So there is like some tethering, but it's just not as strong and ironically, like my disease is that I have really weak collagen. So I have very loose, you know, tethering in my body. Um, but I think that helped me think about the brain and like thought patterns in the same way. So it's instead of having like just something that feels organized in the way it's developing, like having it as a fulcrum, it like shifts. So there isn't like total randomness to it. There's a turn that has some kind of association. It's just a little more opaque, I think outside of anyone's brain that isn't mine. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I also really love the way, um, yeah, like Flower uh, commented on on the way you read the poems, which are really so beautiful, and like the the sort of subtle modulations that happen in your in the tone of your voice, but like while maintaining like kind of a monotone, and it creates this really interesting like droning effect. Um, where it's like hard to, um, I don't know, I guess this is like partly tying into like thinking about um, your the things you were talking about with like lostness and getting lost. And, and there's a few times in the in the text where you say like, now get lost, or you say talk about being lost. Um, and thinking about that, like in relation to ecologies and eco poetics, like this sense of lostness and like searching for a bearing. Um, and also relating back to like sound itself and like um, trying to find bearings within sound, I think is is really interesting. And so the like the monotone that happens, and I think that like the prose poem um, and the, these cut sentences that you have um, create this like sense of like lostness, but also like rhythm in an interesting way that like echoes and repeats. Um, now I'm kind of droning too, but. <laughs> No, that's, that's interesting. I was, you know, I was thinking, I didn't mention this when I was obviously reading, but I don't even know why I read this part in the way that I do. It feels extremely robotic and like intentionally synthetic to me. Um, and I don't know why I necessarily do that because I don't do it as much in the other sections. Um, I think there is something that's still quite performative about it, which I think is inherent in, in disability and like the performance of wellness. And I don't know how I extend that to eco-poetics, but um, I do think there, there's like this understanding of the cyborg like inherent in, in all of that. And so it has to be extended into the, the performance of it and how we meld together that natural versus the unnatural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Cindy commented that it's interesting how ecopoetics address time as nonlinear and associative thought in Beatles. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, I was, I was thinking about um, what Olivia was saying about crypt time um, and sort of like, yeah, nonlinear non experiences of time. Um, as related to uh, Carlos Cosina's work, uh, which I think does really interesting, um, like collapsings of time. And in some of his work, he's really talking about like, he'll have these wild swings between really grandiose views of like, of landscapes and like geological processes and um, like water, like wiping out and like changing landscapes. And then in the next moment, it'll be like hyper fixated on like the mechanics of of perception on a really small uh, scale, like within the body. Um, and I'm just, I'm really fascinated by like that, like dilation of time that happens in his work um, and which I've seen sort of in other, in some other uh, poets that I really love um, from uh, in the North American tradition, like Lisa Robertson and Mei Mei um, people like that. Um, but yeah, I feel like these, these lines of, of non-linear time are, are super interesting too, between some of the explorations we're talking about. Yeah, and I think there's also just a very strong relationship to the archive here. And I wrote, I don't remember even what you said, but I wrote down as you were talking, archive and loss versus preservation. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what I was responding to and what you were saying, but I think it's within this, and it's similar to what Ava was talking about in like, mm -hmm the value of the archive, who controls the archive. But I think we just see that in the natural world too, which is kind of interesting because it's like, we think of it as this human intervention, but it just kind of naturally exists. And like what we can maintain and what is just like naturally decayable, what has to decay and what we preserve and like where time fits into all of that and how linear that progression is, mm -hmm. it's like weird. Yeah. Yeah. Also was thinking about um, within, yeah, from Ava's um, interest in, in lacuna, lacunae, 
and um and like um what's the what's the other word like the erasure but also uh Ava was using this other word um Lacuna. What was the other word that Ava was using about like things being removed or or cut out? Um, well, anyway, I think there's like yeah, interesting things related there with um, having to do with ecologies and like disappearing, like you know the the destruction of of ecosystems um, and things like literally disappearing as related to the archive and like ecological archives and related to like archives of the body and things like that as well. Um, yeah, just trying to, trying to like make, draw those connections between archive and erasure and ecological erasure as well. Yeah, and I think we like, part of what that reminds me of is just like this very redundant consideration of language as body. And so if we're just thinking about like the ecosystem of a poem, um, erasure just has this strange manipulation of that ecosystem and like how far you can go to like continue like sustain the ecosystem until it like collapses in meaning mm. um, i think ava brings it to that breaking point sometimes which is cool um flower had had typed in the chat speaking of the dilation of time i think you had a line that was the poem happening outside the poem which seems to speak this to this non-linear time. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think I was quoting Teddy Lopez Mills. Um, I was really lucky. There was this um, really incredible panel from Beyond Baroque organization, I think in California, about uh, translating avant-garde poetry, mostly from Latin American traditions, like just a few days ago. And I was like, oh shit, gotta watch that, thinking about this one. Um, and yeah, she said this really fascinating thing about translating avant-garde poetry and like understanding it but but like the the length like the grammar vocabulary working in ways that are outside of normative vocabularies and so it's like you can't really fit it in it's not purely about content it's also about like relationality um of of the words used right in the in the source language um in those jumps of association and so that like, yeah, the poem is happening like beyond um, the content of the poem, like, like you're pointing back to. And I just, yeah, found that super fascinating and really resonated with me when thinking about translating Carlos Cosina, which was sometimes like so deeply confounding and exciting at the same time, like just grasping for uh, footholds in, in his work was sometimes such a, a truly, challenging and um like eye-opening uh process <laughs> i love the and thinking of going back a little bit too to like prose poems like carlos cusina doesn't break lines uh in much of his poetry if at all except in some of his early work and um so like thinking through what makes it poetry and like what about it is a prose poem or um what about a prose poem makes it poetry um, besides like the associative jumps that are capable that are capable of happening within them that like in prose would be unacceptable maybe um, in regular prose. Um, but also thinking about, and, and so some of his vocabulary too is like very scientific and very formal. Um, and he finds this way to make it like, to have like a real musicality to it. Um, but he once said something in an interview where he was like, um, he was like, I don't know why you keep calling me a poet. Like, I don't write poetry. And I just like, I kind of really love that because to me, it's so clearly poetry, but it's also like, it's happening outside of poetry in some way too. Um, like it's ever, to me, it's like ever expanding. Um, and that's the kind of poetry that I love is like poetry that's always expanding beyond literature or something like that. Yeah, I think that's like, I don't know, the image that I always think of in the natural world is water, which is like, you know, obviously fluid and uncontainable. And it's, uh, you know, a very Taoist kind of image to fall back on to like this ever bending, ever shifting thing. Um, but to consider that in language, I think that's something we both are interested in, which is this like maximalist, um, uncontainable 
thing in language and um, you know the demarcations in metaphor or like the demarcations of poems are inherently like vague if you really consider them and it's something I would love to do when I was younger is just call anything a poem like a lamp is a poem and I think that's a very young way of <laughs> considering poetry but I think you know that's kind of what, what we're always doing is we're conceiving of the world as poem and so kind of like the container is always just our world um which is really corny but <laughs> it's something that we think about a lot <laughs> yeah it's a poem and it says it is exactly <laughs> um flowers said c Wright says it's a poem if i say it is yeah, hell yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um well i would love to i'm very happy to end on a cd right quote I'm very happy. <laughs> i love cd right um but yeah i don't know did you have any any other thoughts olivia or did anyone else uh want to chime in good i think we've held everyone hostage long enough but if anyone has any other <laughs> to say i'm sure we'd love to hear it well thank you olivia and thank you all so much for being here really Appreciate your presence and thoughts. And just wanted to say real quick, if you go to nolapoetry.com, we've got two more events tonight and three more virtual events tomorrow. And then we start our live schedule. Hope to see you all some more. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Thank Jonathan. You. Thanks.